Hi, my name is David Warner Matheson. These ancient myths have so much to offer us, and yet we really don't hear what they're saying unless we listen to them in the language that they're actually speaking, or I believe that we can really hear their message much more clearly if we listen to them in the language that they're actually speaking. They have so much to offer your life and my life. I believe they were given as a precious inheritance to humanity. And so I'm all about trying to uh, not just talk about the ancient myths as an intellectual exercise, but as a way of pointing us towards the myths for the wisdom that they have to offer for our life. It's ancient wisdom, but it applies right to the present moment. And present moment um, or being present is a term that gets used a lot. You know, have, have you ever wondered what uh, a life coach or a teacher means when they start talking about being present? It's a term that can be um, used too much or, or watered down, but it really means something very specific or it really does point to a very important concept. And I want to uh, talk about what, uh, show a picture of what I think being present means, or this picture illustrates one level of this concept of the present or being present. I'll show the picture in a minute, but it's, a, it's actually a rather famous photograph. It was taken by a photographer named Christopher Horner of the Pittsburgh Tribune Review, and it was taken of a dad and his son, a dad and his eight-year-old son, and they're going to a baseball game. And in fact, the eight-year-old son, it's 2016, and this eight-year-old boy plays Little League Baseball, and his dad is taking him to his first ever professional baseball game. They live in Florida, so they're going to a spring training game. And the, the eight-year-old son is seeing his first pro baseball game, and he's really excited. And he's, uh, he's so excited, he even borrows his dad's cell phone to take a picture of Pittsburgh Pirates batter Danny Ortiz. And he's taking this picture, and he's texting it. And uh, I don't have to tell you that in this uh, modern age, eight-year-olds are masters at texting <laughs> photographs. And then this happens. And so remember, this is a picture of being present. So this photo captures the moment during spring training in 2016 when a bat came loose from the hands of the batter, Danny Ortiz of the Pittsburgh Pirates, and flew into the stands right towards the head of this eight-year-old fan who was at his first game and he was busy texting his photo that he'd taken using his dad's phone. And he didn't see this plank of wood flying towards his face, spinning towards his face until the last moment. And at that last moment, the father of the boy, the father's name is Sean Cunningham, reached out his arm and averted disaster. And the father later said modestly, quote, guess I'd call it dad mode, just protecting my son, unquote. But let's just think about what we're seeing here in this picture. The dad takes the exact right action to save his son's head from getting hit in the face by this flying bat. Let's look at a couple of other video clips that show something similar. These are uh, quick reflexes at just the right moment, often in this case involving a dad who's saving an infant or a child from potential disaster. But I can also say that I uh, remember something very similar happening where my wife uh, averted potential disaster with my two sons when they were very young. So it's not just dads, but uh, it often does involve a child, in particular your own child. So note that in some cases, these appear to involve something more than just quick reflexes. In at least one instance, it's difficult to explain how the dad even knew that the baby was in the act of falling. Like, which of the five physical senses would you say was responsible for alerting this man that he needed to stick his hand out to this spot 
in space in order to catch this falling infant just in time. In fact, it looks as if he was actually snoozing or at least resting his conscious mind right up to the critical moment where his hand shoots out and saves the day. It's almost as if his subconscious was aware of what was going on, even though his conscious mind was not. And I would argue that this indeed is exactly what was going on. I would even argue that the subconscious at times clearly demonstrates an ability to perceive things which at least seem to be beyond the limits of our five senses. So what makes these photographs, like the one I showed at the beginning, or these videos, so remarkable is that we're not always so in tune with our subconscious. So moments like this are unusual, not normal. We're in fact often oblivious to our subconscious or divided from it unaware of what it might be perceiving. But it seems that in moments of extreme need, and then even then only sometimes, often involving danger to a child, this almost superhuman ability can be seen to suddenly kick in. And as Sean Cunningham put it when he saved his son from that flying bat, he just went into, quote, dad mode. And I believe that the world's ancient myths and scriptures tell us and show us that we are, in a sense, divided from ourselves in some way, separated from a part of us that is actually aware of things far beyond what our conscious mind is normally aware of, reaching out even beyond the limits of our five senses to have awareness of a world with which our conscious mind is normally completely unacquainted, and to which then we, living in our conscious mind and divided from a part of ourselves, are actually oblivious most of the time. We're separated from this part of ourselves, the myths seem to imply, by the process of being integrated into human society with all of its necessary rules and norms and mores and structures which require us to start making judgments and assessments at a very early age as we learn to navigate our way within a family structure which contains people with more power than we have and this continues as we grow up until we've developed a conscious mind that's full of the ability to make very delicate and fine-tuned assessments weighing one decision or course of action against the alternatives in order to decide what to do or what to say or when it's our turn to go at an intersection if we're driving a car and so on. And while all of these judgments are very necessary to our survival in human society, they have this effect of actually dividing us from ourselves, from part of ourselves that becomes the subconscious and with which we become disconnected because of our conscious mind's preoccupation with all these judgment calls and with weighing one thing against another all the time during our waking hours and also with thinking back on the decisions that we've made and trying to pull out lessons from them or thinking forward into the future and trying to weigh, okay, should I do this or should I do that? And those are all necessary things, but they keep us from being present and they keep us from being in touch with all this information that's actually available to the subconscious mind, which is uh, absorbing information, far more information than our conscious mind realizes, not just from our five senses, although that's a vast amount, but also from our gut and from um, somehow connected to even beyond our five senses in some instances. And in fact, in the myths, we can actually see this division from our wider awareness being dramatized for us. And I'd point to one of the oldest myths on record, a myth that we know of because of the preservation of extremely ancient texts which were inscribed into clay tablets, the Sumerian and Babylonian texts containing the Epic of Gilgamesh. And in that very ancient myth, dating back in some of the tablets to more than 4,000 years ago, 
we see the character of Enkidu, who lives among the wild animals of the fields and the forests, and we see him become entangled with civilization when he's seduced by a temple prostitute named Shamhat. At the beginning of the epic, the semi-divine Gilgamesh is the king of Uruk in modern-day Iraq. In fact, those two words, Uruk and Iraq, are related linguistically. So Gilgamesh is the king over Uruk. He is two-thirds divine, one-third mortal, but he's abusing his power and overstepping his boundaries, and the people complain about it to the gods. And so the gods, to solve the problem, create a wild man named Enkidu, who's going to be very much like Gilgamesh in many respects. He's the same size and, and same amount of power. And um, this is going to solve the problem of Gilgamesh and his tyranny because they're going to meet up and they're going to uh, clash with one another and then they're going to become fast friends. But at first, Enkidu is running with the animals of the fields because he's created as this wild man. He's like a, a twin to Gilgamesh, but he's different. He's, he's covered with hair and he runs out in the field like a wild animal. In fact, he lives with the animals and he's their friend. And whenever hunters or trappers capture an animal in a pit or a trap, Enkidu lets them free. And so a young hunter... Uh, sees Enkidu one day drinking water along with the animals at the watering hole and he's frightened by the sight of this uh, powerful wild man and he, and he goes back and he tells his father that he's discovered the one who's running with the animals and must be, letting the, it must be the one who's letting these animals escape from all the traps. And the father says, okay, well, he knows how to solve the problem. Bring a woman to seduce this wild man and after that, after he slept with her, the animals will no longer trust him anymore. And this is exactly what happens. So Shamhat comes to the wilderness and seduces Enkidu. And after that encounter, Enkidu discovers that the animals now flee from him. And what's more, Enkidu no longer has the speed and his former speed and ability to keep up with the animals. What's happened? Well, Enkidu is becoming entangled with civilization. Not only do he and Shamhat make love for six days in a row, but then Shamhat introduces him to other humans, taking him to a shepherd's camp where he's given human food and alcohol to drink. And the text tells us that he gains wide knowledge, but he loses his closeness with the beasts of the field. And I would argue that it's not just that he's not as fast of a runner, uh, and, and that's why he can't keep up with the animals. He's actually lost access to part of his instincts and his wider animal-like intuition, his natural intuition. And he started to develop a conscious mind of what he should do and should not do, and what he should wear, how he should act. And he gets a haircut from a barber, and he's gained knowledge of society but it's like also like a net in his mind the text doesn't say this i'm saying this our conscious mind is like a net or it's it's like a, a mesh of all these different strings and connections that weigh uh what to do to you know this rule against that rule and this experience against that experience and so while most of us were not born and raised in the wild among the wild animals like enki do in the ancient myth, I'm convinced that his character dramatizes very important aspects of our own situation in this life, in which we also have lost contact with some aspect of who we are as a product of our growing up and learning the norms and rules and structures that we need for navigating through a society with other people, and in doing so, developing a conscious mind, which looks back to the past and looks forward to the future, which is a very essential and critical tool for many things such as judging and assessing and weighing options and entertaining doubts and formulating hopes and making plans and distilling lessons from past experience and learning from mistakes and all those things. 
but which by its very nature tends to divide us from our subconscious mind and from what our subconscious knows and from the wider universe with which our subconscious is actually in touch and which is always gathering real-time information, real-time information from the world around us through our five physical senses and even somehow beyond them. It seems to be in touch with and aware of information which goes beyond our physical senses somehow, which isn't well understood, but it's actually very real. You may have heard stories of people who wake up in the middle of the night with a need to call someone far away or with information about a loved one far away, information which turns out to be accurate and crucial information, which is very difficult or even impossible to explain through the five physical senses. Or you may have even had incidents like this happen in your own life or receive premonitions or messages from your subconscious which turned out to be true and which you have no real way of explaining without crossing over into areas that conventional science tends to deny because of its need to focus on strictly materialist explanations and because of its rejection of the possibility of sensing or gathering information that goes beyond the boundaries of the physical material world. So we're in a very real sense divided from ourselves and for the most part we're out of touch with a very important part of who we are and we're divided from connections with a wider realm which is not bounded by the physical senses or the laws of physics as they're commonly understood and the myths dramatize this division they show it to us for our deeper understanding Enkidu has lost something through his incorporation into society and his interaction with other men and women and he cannot go back to the way he was before but the myths do illustrate a solution and they often illustrate it through the use of twins of some sort in Enkidu and Gilgamesh become one very well-known example of a twinned pair in ancient myth. But there are many others, including Castor and Pollux, or Psyche and Eros, Esau and Jacob, Sabalinke and Hunapu of the Maya, and even Thomas Didymus and Jesus in the Gospel stories. The word Didymus signifying the twin. So he's Thomas the twin. And there are many others in world myth. Often one of these twins is mortal and the other is divine. Or one twin goes down to death and the other searches for him or her. And this situation is illustrative of our own condition. The myths are dramatizing something that is true of our own situation in this incarnate life in which we've been separated from ourselves, divided from ourselves. And in order to transcend that condition, we cannot go back to the situation before we developed a conscious mind and our detailed understanding of the various structures of society and all those judgments that living in society requires. But we can get in touch with our own deeper self, our own authentic self. In some ancient traditions, it's called our higher self or even our divine self our divine twin. And this is what we see dramatized for our understanding in the ancient myths, in this wrestling of Gilgamesh and Enkidu, or the descent by Pollux into the underworld to bring back his twin brother, Castor, or the searching of Psyche for her divine lover, Eros, and many, many other episodes from around the world. We've been divided from ourselves, and like Enkidu, We cannot go back to the way we were, but we can go forward, or indeed the myths depict it as going upwards, or or, uh, sometimes they also depict it as going downwards into darkness, as I mentioned, a a descent into darkness. And we can get in touch with an invisible realm, an unbounded realm, a realm in which we actually have access to information which is not limited by the boundaries of our own five physical senses, a realm of 
potential, of infinite potential, in fact, a realm of the gods. We see this in the Odyssey, for instance, of ancient Greece, again and again, in which Odysseus is the most attuned to the realm of the gods. He's the one who perceives when he's been visited by the goddess Athena, or who senses the presence of a river god when he's thrashing around in the ocean among the breakers, trying to find a safe way to get to shore after being cast adrift in the deep for days. The myths show us that we have access to the same realm, the same source of assistance in our lives. We've all experienced some kind of trauma or division from ourselves in this life, but we all have a subconscious. And the myths illustrate that we all have a higher self, a divine twin. And when we start to understand the ancient myths in the way that they're really trying to speak to us, we start to hear their incredible message. Thank you.